Board Game Reader presents Code Names. Setup. Players split up into two teams of similar size and skill. You need at least four players, two teams of two, for a standard game. Variants for two or three players can be found on the back page. Each team chooses one player to be their spy master. Both spy masters sit on the same side of the table. The other players sit across from their spy masters. They are field operatives. Randomly choose 25 code names and place them on the table in a 5x5 grid. Note, while shuffling the codename cards, be sure to flip over half the deck once in a while. This will mix the words more thoroughly. The key. Each game has one key that reveals the secret identities of the cards at the table. The spy masters should choose the key randomly and slide it into the stand between them. Any side can be up. Don't think about it. Just slide it into the stand and don't let the field operative see it. The key corresponds to the grid on the table. Blue squares correspond to words that blue team must guess. Blue agents. Red squares correspond to words that red team must guess. Red agents. Pale squares are innocent bystanders, and a black square is an assassin who should never be contacted at all. Starting team. The four lights around the edge of the key card indicates which team starts. The starting team has nine words to guess. The other team has eight. The starting team will give the first clue of the game. Agent cards. The red agent cards go in a stack in front of the red spy master. The blue agent cards should be in front of the blue spy master. This helps everyone remember which team they are on. The double agent belongs to whichever team starts. Flip it to that team's color. It will be one of that team's agent cards for the duration of the game. The innocent bystander cards and the assassin should be kept in between, where both spy masters can reach them easily. Game Overview Spy masters know the secret identities of 25 agents. Their teammates know the agents only by their codenames. Spy masters takes turns giving one word clues. A clue may relate to multiple words on the table. The field operatives try to guess which words their spy masters meant. When a field operative touches a word, the spy master reveals its secret identity. If the field operatives guess correctly, they may continue guessing until they run out of ideas for the given clue or until they hit the wrong person. Then it's the other team's turn to give a clue and guess. The first team to contact all their agents wins the game. Teams take turns. The starting team is indicated by the four lights on the edge of the keycard. Giving a clue. If you're the spy master, you are trying to think of one word clue that relates to some of the words your team is trying to guess. When you think you have a good clue, you say it. You also say one number, which tells your teammates how many codenames are related to your clue. Example, two of your words are nut and bark. Both of these grow in trees, so you say tree, two. You are allowed to give a clue for only one word, cashew one but it's fun to try for two or more. Getting four words with one clue is a big accomplishment. One word. Your clue must be only one word. You are not allowed to give extra hints. For example, don't say, this may be a bit of a stretch. You're playing code names. It's always a bit of a stretch. Your clue cannot be any of the code names visible on the table. On later turns, some code names will be covered up, so a clue that is not legal now may be legal later. Making contact. When a spy master gives clues, his or her field operatives try to figure out what it means. They can debate it amongst themselves, but the spy master must keep a straight face. The operatives indicate their official guess when one of them touches one of the code names on the table. If the field operative touches a card belonging to his or her team, the spy master covers the word with an agent in that color. The operatives get another guess, but not another clue. If the field operative touches an innocent bystander, the spy master covers it with an innocent bystander card. This ends the turn. If the field operative touches a card belonging to the other team, the word is covered by one of the other team's agent's cards. This ends the turn and it helps the other team. If the field operative touches the assassin, the word is covered by the assassin card. The team that contacted the assassin loses. Tip, before saying your clue out loud, make sure it doesn't relate to the assassin. Number of guesses. The field operatives must always make at least one guess. Any wrong guess ends the turn immediately, but if the field operative guess a word of their team's color, they can keep guessing. You can stop guessing at any time, but usually you want to guess as many words as a spy master said. Sometimes you might even want to guess one more. Example, red team's first clue was tree. Two, the red operative wanted to guess orange and nut. She guessed orange first. That was an innocent bystander, so she did not get a chance to guess nut. Blue team took a turn and correctly guessed two words. Now it's the red team's turn again. The red spy master says river, free. The red operative is pretty sure that Amazon is a river, so she touches that card. The spy master covers it with a red agent card, so she gets to go again. A river has a bed, so she touches that code name. It's also red, so she can go again. She's not sure of the third river word. She picks nut. This has nothing to do with river. 
She is guessing a word from the previous clue. Nut is a red word. The operative has made three correct guesses for the clue, River Free. She is allowed one final guess. She can try to find a third river word, or she can try to find the other tree word, or she can stop at free and let blue team have a turn. You are only allowed one extra guess. In the example above, the red operative would have been allowed four guesses because her spy master said the number three. When the field operatives say they are done guessing, or when they guess wrong, it is the other team's turn. Game flow. Spy masters take turns giving clues. After a spy master gives a clue, his or her team starts guessing. Their turn ends when they guess wrong. When they decide to stop, or when they have made the maximum number of guesses for that clue, then it's the other team's turn. Ending the game. The game ends when one team has all their words covered. That team wins. It is possible to win on the other team's turn if they guess your last word. The game can end early if a field operative makes contact with the assassin. That operative's team loses. Set up for the next game. Do other people want a chance to be spy masters? Set up for the second game is easy. Remove the cards covering the code names and put them back in a stack. Now just flip over the 25 code names and you're ready to go. Penalty for invalid clues. If a spy master gives an invalid clue, the team turns ends immediately. As an additional penalty, the other team's spy master may cover one of his or her words with an agent card before giving the next clue. But if no one notices that a clue is invalid, it counts as valid. Keeping a straight face. The spy master is expected to keep a straight face. Do not reach for any card while your teammates are considering the words. When a teammate touches a word, consult the key card and cover the word with the card of the corresponding color. When a teammate chooses a word of the correct color, you should act as though it was exactly the word you meant, even if it wasn't. If you are a field operative, you should focus on the table when you are making guesses. Do not make eye contact with the spy master while you are guessing. This will help you avoid nonverbal cues. When your information is strictly limited to what can be conveyed with one word and one number, you are playing in the spirit of the game. What's the timer for? Sorry, we almost forgot. You see, we don't use the sand timer very often. If a player is thinking too long, any player can flip the sound timer and ask the slow player to make a decision before time runs out. If you are having trouble, you can even use the sound timer on yourself. If you can't find a good clue before time runs out, just give a clue for your hardest word and keep thinking while the other team plays. If you prefer to play with strict time limits, you can download our timer app at codenamesgame.com. Valid Clues We playtested various rules. Some groups likes the rules one way, some likes the rules another way. You should experiment to find out what your group likes. Firm rules. Some clues are invalid because they violate the spirit of the game. Your clue must be about the meaning of the words. You can't use your clue to talk about the letter in a word or its position on the table. Gland is not a valid clue for England. You can't tie bug, bed, and bow together with a clue B, free, nor with a clue like free, free. However, letters and numbers are valid clues as long as they refer to meanings. You can use X1 as a clue for ray. You can use 8 free as a clue for the ball, figure, or octopus. The number you say after your clue can't be used as a clue. Citrus 8 is not a valid clue for lemon and octopus. You must play in English. A foreign word is only allowed if the players in your group would use it in an English sentence. For example, you can't use Apfel as a clue for apple and Berlin, but you can use strudel. You can't say any form of a visible word on a table. Until break is covered up by a card, you can't say break, broken, breakage, or breakdown. You can't say part of a compound word on the table. Until horseshoe is covered up, you can't say horse, shoe, unhorsed, or snowshoe. Homonyms and spelling. English has a lot of homonyms. For example, night sounds like night. But these two words don't mean the same thing. Same sounding words with different meanings and different spellings are considered different words so you can't give night-related clues for night. Words that are spelled the same or considered the same, even though they may have different pronunciations and meanings. For example, actors take a bow, and a bow is part of a ship. So you could use bow as a clue for theatre and ship. You could also use it as a clue for archery-related things, even though that bow is pronounced differently. You are allowed to spell out your clue. For example, if you want your teammates to guess theatre and string, you can spell out bow without committing to a pronunciation. You can give the clue night, even when night is one of the code names on the table. But you can't use T-H-E-A-T-R-E -E when theater is on the table. Theater and theater are different words of the same word. You should spell out your clue if someone asks. If you aren't strong on spelling, ask the opposing spy master for help. Tip, spelling is not just for homonyms. It's also useful when a room is noisy or when the players have different accents. Don't be too strict. England and Ireland were originally compound words, but in this century, Ireland is a valid clue for England. Even land is a valid clue for England. 
Anybody who says she can't say Sparrow when Row is on a table is just trying to cause trouble. If the opposing Spymaster allows it, the clue's valid. If you aren't sure, ask your opponent, quietly, so that the others can't hear. Flexible rules. Sometimes you just have to make judgement calls about what is valid and what is not. Different groups may prefer to play the game differently. Compound words. English has three ways to write a compound word. Greenhouse is one word. Packrat is two words. Mother-in-law is hyphenated. Technically, only greenhouse can be a one-word clue. You can decide to allow any compound words. However, in no case should a player be allowed to invent compound words. Lunar squid is not a valid clue for moon and octopus. Proper names. Proper names are always valid clues, they follow the other rules. George is a valid clue, but you might want to specify whether you mean George Washington or George W. Bush. Your group can agree to count proper names as one word. This would also allow titles such as the Three Musketeers. Even if you don't allow multi-word proper names, you might want to make an exception for place names like New York. Spy masters should not be allowed to make up names. Not even names that turn out to be real. Sue Me is not a valid clue for China and Lawyer. Acronyms and abbreviations. Technically, CIA is not one word, but it is a great clue. You can decide to allow common abbreviations like UK, LOL, and PhD. And words like laser, radar, and sonar are always allowed, even though they originated as acronyms. Homonyms. Some people prefer to allow a more liberal use of homonyms. You can allow night to be a clue for night-related things, if that makes the game more fun for you. Rhymes. Rhymes are always valid when they refer to meanings. Snail is a valid clue for male, because this rhyme is a common phrase. Snail is also a valid clue for whale, because they are both animals. Snail is not a valid clue for scale, because their main association is through the sound of the words. If someone in your group has a job weighing snails, however, this clue is perfectly fine. Some people like to allow any kind of rhyming clue. If you decide to allow this, just remember that you aren't allowed to indicate that you're giving a rhyming clue. Your operatives will have to figure that out for themselves. Expert clue zero. You're allowed to use zero as the number part of your clue. For example, feathers zero means none of our words relate to feathers. If zero is the number, the usual limit on guesses does not apply. Field operators can guess as many words as they want. They must still guess at least one word. If you're not sure why this is useful, don't worry, you'll figure it out. Expert clue unlimited. Sometimes you may have multiple unguessed words related to clues from the previous rounds. If you want your team to guess more than one of them, you may say unlimited instead of a number. For example, feathers unlimited. The disadvantage is that the field operatives do not know how many words are related to the new clue. The advantage is they may guess as many words as they want. Two-player game. If there are only two of you, you can play in the same team. This two-player variant also works for larger groups of people who don't feel like competing against each other. You will try to get a high score against a simulated opponent. Set up the game as usual. One player will be the spy master, and the rest will be the field operatives. That other team has no players, but you still need their stack of agent cards. Your team should go first, so be sure to pick a key card that makes you the starting team. Play your turns as usual. Try to avoid enemy agents and the assassin. The spy master simulates the enemy team by covering up one of the words each time they get a turn. So the spy master gets to choose which word is covered. So there's a bit of strategy here. If your team contacts the assassin, or if all the enemy agents are contacted, you lose. There is no score. If your team wins, give yourself a score based on how many agent cards are still left in the enemy stack. Note, your score will be determined by how many turns you needed, and also by how many enemy agents you contacted accidentally. Free player game. Three players who want to be on the same team can play as described above. If two players want to compete against each other, they can be spy masters, and the third player can be their operative. Setup and gameplay are as usual, except that a single field operative is working for both sides, just like spies in real life. The winning spy master is determined the usual way. The field operative tries to do a good job for both sides. Board Game Reader. Listen, learn, play.